Let's pray. <laughs> Father, we thank you. You are a good, a holy, an awesome, and a gracious God. Father, we pray as always that this message would be a message that you, God, have for your people. May the proud amongst us be humbled and the humble lifted up. It's in the name of Jesus we pray this. Amen. Uh, Bill, I uh, forgot to bring down the controller. Can you run that down to me, please? But you guys know where to go. We're opening up to the book of Matthew, chapter 5. Matthew, chapter 5. We're going through the Beatitudes. And the reason we're going through the Beatitudes, this started way back when, way back when it started, uh, on how we are to witness to this current culture. And it morphed into the Beatitudes because the Beatitudes really are Jesus is in front of the crowds, and he's gathering his disciples together. And what we're seeing here is not just the attitude, but the character attributes, really, of Christ himself and how we are being conformed to the likeness of Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 5, beginning at verse 1. Say amen if you're there. Amen. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain. And when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for, the, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Let's stop right there. Where we are, these are the attributes of Jesus that he's conforming us to. Verse 7. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed, of course, simply means what? Happy. Happy are those that give mercy. They receive mercy. So let's take a, a minute. I, I meant that to stagger, so hold on. Let's take a minute and just take the word mercy. How would you define mercy? You know, before we actually make guesses, have you ever heard of the mercy rule in, like, kids' sports? The mercy rule. Uh, what is that rule? That, that's when, like, let's say a t-ball or, or, or whatever, the score is, like, 45 to 3, uh, whatever it is, and uh, the mercy rule kicks in. Basically, there's no way this other opponent can come back from this, and instead of just piling on mercy, they deserve According to the rules of the game, according to the rules of the game, they deserve to get beat up on even more. Make it nine to three. But we have mercy. We don't give them what they deserve or what is owed them or what is according to the standard of the rules. We stop there and we give them mercy. All right. Uh, what about some of these uh, more violent sports? You know, like the wrestling or the MMA or whatever else is, it's not wrestling, it's MMA. These fights and things like that where they put people in chokeholds and they're doing all this. And then all of a sudden, if the guy takes his hand and does what? If he taps, you got to let go. You lose, but you don't die. Uh, and the guy could have killed you. The guy could have killed you. He overpowered you to such a degree that he could have killed you. But if you tap out... Mercy. You don't get what could have been coming. Instead, you're set free. That's mercy. So if I were to define mercy, this is uh, my definition, exhibiting pity, compassion, or grace to someone in your debt or under your power. Exercising pity and compassion on those who deserve Harsh treatment. Exercising pity and compassion on those who deserve. Their works deserve it. But God is a God of mercy, isn't he? We say that word all the time. God is a God of mercy. God exhibits pity, 
compassion and grace to people in his debt and under his power. Even to those, especially to those, who what? Deserve harsh treatment. Is anyone else like God? In his wrath, he thinks on mercy. That's God. God is a God of mercy. James 5.11 and Exodus 34.16 say it this way. You have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. I love that verse because he uses the word purpose. What is God's purpose in everything he's doing? To show compassion and mercy. That is his purpose, his goal. His goal in your life is to show you mercy. That's what he wants to do. He yearns to be merciful. The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. I want to highlight a couple of events in the life of Jesus to simply point this out. About how God, Jesus is God in the flesh. When we talk about the image of God, the Bible itself says that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. The reason Jesus plays so prominently on our windows is not because we believe him to be the most important person of the triune God. It's because when God tells us to think on him, who does he tell us to think on? Jesus. He's the image of God. So let's take some events from Jesus' life. God became flesh and the person of Jesus. Was his life a life of mercy? Let's talk first, John 4. So Jesus came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, weird as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. That's about noon. That's my parenthetical statement, just so we know. That's how the Jews did it, 3, 6, 9, 12. So it's about noon. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. Now, when did the women of the day go to the well? In the early morning. They would go to the well in the early morning so that they would have water for the day. Well, this particular woman interrupts the middle of her day, goes to this well by herself. What's the reason for that? She's an outcast. Maybe it is shame. See, unlike other events, this lady, she is who she, we thought she was. According to the Bible, according to interaction with Jesus, she has not just had one husband, not two, not three, not four, but count them five. And the guy that she was sleeping with wasn't even her husband. So instead of the town calling somebody a name that they aren't, town was calling somebody a name that she was. She comes to the well at noon because the other women don't want to be seen with her. Maybe there is some shame there, or maybe it's just because I am who you think I am. Jesus travels all the way there just to meet this woman, a woman shamed, a woman deserving of the shame. He travels all the way there just to talk to her. Just to talk to her. Tells her about who he is. And John makes it very clear to this woman of Samaria that he is the savior of the world and that if she believes in him, all her past shame is washed away. He makes a special trip at a special time to that particular well, to talk to that particular woman who was what we thought she was, to say, you are not too far gone. I do not want to give you what you deserve. I am a God of mercy and compassion. I want to forgive you, and out of you will come living water. Luke 19, 5, when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. 
Zacchaeus is what they thought he was. A traitor, a Jew in league with the military Romans. And not just a Jew that became a traitor, but a Jew that became a traitor and then fleeced the Jews. Fleeced them, defrauded them, gave them harsh treatment, and got protection from the Romans so that nothing could happen to him. He was what we thought he was. Jesus makes a special trip to that tree. There was a whole crowd of people there. Whose house could he have eaten at? Anybody's. He finds the worst dude who is precisely what we thought he was and says, come on down. I'm going to eat with you. He takes flack from the religious leaders for eating there, doesn't he? If you know the story, he takes flack for that. He puts his reputation on the line. And he goes in and he says, Zacchaeus, I want you to know you are not too far gone. Zacchaeus is overwhelmed, not with wrath, not with judgment. What is Zacchaeus overwhelmed with? Mercy. And it changes his heart. I'm not too far gone after everything I've done. And he says, I will give back what I've stolen and pay. Pay everything back. And Jesus makes a declaration. What does he say? Do you remember? Today, salvation has come to this household. Everything forgiven. Jesus stood up and said to her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go now and live no longer a life of sin. You know this story, don't you? A woman caught in the very act of adultery. A lot of times people bring up, where was the man? He was just as guilty. That's true. They're hypocrites. Agreed. But she was still caught in the act of adultery. It takes two to tango, baby. So she was still guilty. The fact that they did not bring the man doesn't make her less what? Guilty. So, caught in the very act of adultery. The law of Moses did say that a woman such as that deserves to be stoned. The rules say what? Stoner. Kill her. That's what the rules say. Do you know what's amazing about Jesus? He did not defy the rule. He didn't say, eh, I'm changing it. You know what he said? He who is without sin... Be the first to throw a stone. Basically, the rule also condemns you. There's one person that had a right to throw a stone. It was Jesus. And he chose not to throw the stone. Because he is a God of what? Of mercy. He is a God of mercy. Not giving anyone what they deserve, anyone receive him what they deserve but giving mercy then of course we have this Jesus said father forgive them for they know not what they do and they cast lots to divide his garments where was this uttered I want you to try try very hard to remember that yes Jesus is God amen I'm not belittling that or minimizing that at all but he's also a man I think sometimes we forget, don't we, that Jesus has all the attendant emotions, feelings, and psychological makeup of a human, because he is a human. So, live it. You've spent the past three and a half years casting out their demons, healing their diseases, cleansing their leprosy, Feeding their poor. That's what you spent your time doing. You ride into Jerusalem and they call you the son of David. They say, save us, Hosanna. They throw down their cloaks for you. 
And then by the end of the week, perhaps, it's not explicit, but perhaps some of the people you healed, some of the people whose demons you cast out are in a courtyard, and when it's you and the murderer, the crowd yells out, give us Barabbas. You're looking at the very eyes of the people you healed. The very people whose demons were cast out. Give us Barabbas. And then they beat you. They flog you. They force you to carry the cross. They spit at you. And you hang there bleeding and dying. And the religious leaders look up at you and say, he saved others. But he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Come on down from the cross now. Then maybe I'll believe in you. And they spit. The Romans, they're the ones that nailed you in there. And right at the foot, they're gambling for your clothes. While you sit there and you bleed and you die. What do you say? What do you say? Well, this is what he said. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Forgive them. It's an amazing thing, isn't it? When you think about it. You and I know what we are if we're honest with ourselves. Honestly. You know what you think. You know what you say. You know what you do. You know those secret opinions that you have. You know how elevated you think your opinion is over everybody else. You know how you think your good deeds have merited something. You know. You know who you really are. And when you think about it, the sins of your past are ever present before God. What you thought is long in the past is right in his face. It might be in your past, but it's in God's present. You know who you are. I know who I am. And what does he say to you? I forgive you. I will give you mercy. Mercy. I forgive you. The reason I bring this up in this way is because only those who truly have received mercy are going to give it. We live in a world today with very little mercy. Honestly, we live in a world today with very little mercy. Mercy. There's a whole lot of judgment. There's a whole lot of anger. There's a whole lot of, I hope they get their comeuppance. And I think the reason for that is because we don't really understand how much mercy we've been given. I want you to open, I don't usually have you turn to two places, but I do want you to open up to Luke 7, because it's not all going to fit on the screen, and I want you to be able to see it. So Luke 7, 36 to 50. Within context, Jesus is invited to a Pharisee's house. If you're unfamiliar, the Pharisees were the religious leaders of the day. Luke 7, 36 to 50. So he gets invited to the Pharisee, the religious leader's house. One of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment. 
And standing behind him in his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she's a sinner. And Jesus answering said to them, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, Say it, teacher. A certain moneylender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could, denarii is a unit of um, monetary measurement. So just think $500, $50, that kind of a thing. Verse 42. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon answered, the one I suppose for whom he canceled a larger debt. And he said to him, you've judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet. But she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore I tell you her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much, but he who is forgiven little loves little. And he said to her, Your sins are forgiven. And those who were at table with him began to say amongst themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. What's the key? The key is this verse right here. Her sins, which are many, are forgiven. What does Jesus admit here about the woman? She is what you say she is. It's because she understands the depth of what she needs forgiven that she then loves much. But you, you hypocritical Pharisee, you are under the impression that you barely have a debt to God. You're under the impression almost that God owes you for all your praying and all your Bible reading and all your uh, outward holiness. You're under this faulty impression. Look what she did for me because she understood the depth. Those who are forgiven much love much. Those who are forgiven little love little. If there is ever a time in your life you know, sometimes, you know, with children and, and, and other things, you do need discipline in order to raise people. Amen to that, and I'm a big believer in discipline that my wife meets out. Ah, uh, <laughs> I'm a big believer in it. <laughs> um, having said that, if there's ever confusion in your mind between judgment and mercy, like, what should I do? If there's ever a question... Always, always, if you're going to make an error, make the error on the side of mercy. If an error must be made, mercy comes from the heart of God. Leave judgment up to him, shall we? Mercy comes from the heart of God. We live in an age of they deserve it. Don't we? We live in an age of they deserve it. And it gets worse by the day. What we're coming out of, maybe, uh, what we're coming out of in this whole pandemic thing, it is all wrapped up in they deserve it. They deserve it. Racial hatred. Financial strife, shutdowns in government, people in government, whether you got the vaccine or you didn't, everybody's mad. Everybody's judging. Let's pretend you're right on all the issues. Let's just pretend, shall we? You're right on every issue that you feel strongly about. And let's pretend your neighbor's wrong on all of them. If in your heart you 
are secretly hoping for his comeuppance. You are in a dangerous spiritual position, brother and sister. Because if you want your wrong-headed neighbor to have his comeuppance, oh, you shall get yours. You shall get yours. You shall get yours. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Let God do the judging. Let us exhibit mercy. Do we really want to live in a world where those that deserve and those that don't? The goal of the Christian is that when they see people suffering, they give mercy. What would you think of me? It, it's not a threat any longer in the sense that we feel the threat. What would you think of me if someone with AIDS walked in and I said, you know, pff, just dirty needles and wrong-headed morality. I gave you nothing. You did it to yourself. What would you think? I know I wouldn't do that, sweetie, but you have to say, play the game, play the game. <laughs> what would you think? Now, the reason you think that way is because you know it's not a threat, what? To you, right? They're doing a good job, aren't they? Now everybody's a threat to everybody else. Everybody's a threat to everybody else. And no one is granted mercy. No one. Because we're all a threat to each other. Look at what they've done on how we think about people. They are no longer objects of mercy, even if they're wrong. Even if they're making dumb choices. They're threats. You must ask yourself the question, would God have me judge or would God have me give mercy? See, one who knows the depth of mercy they have received will freely give mercy to others. One who does not recognize the depth of mercy offered will not only not give mercy, but will forfeit mercy for themselves. If you have begun looking at people as a threat, they've got to you. They've got to you. They've got to you. People are created in the image of Almighty God. They are objects to be loved. It's that simple. And just to back this up, please listen to James 2.13. It's really hard to hear. For judgment is without mercy to one who shows no mercy. Look at that first sentence. Judgment is without mercy to those who show no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Blessed are the merciful for they shall receive mercy. Really, people, we just need to understand how much we've been given. And then, give that to those around us. Amen? Amen. God is good all the time. Father, we thank you. You are a good, a holy, an awesome, and a gracious God. Father, I pray that you would protect us Bless us. I pray, Father, that we would be agents of mercy, understanding the depth of mercy we've been given through Christ. It's in your name we pray this. Amen. Now that